Brendan, sir. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call to the meeting to order. This is the City of San Diego Commission on Police Practices Ad Hoc Transition Planning Committee uh, of Friday, uh, June the 25th. Um, I'll do roll call from the uh, participants uh, tab. Uh, I'm Doug Case. I am the uh, chair of the uh, committee. Uh, we have present uh, our executive director, Charmaine Mosley, uh, committee member, Nancy Vaughn, uh, commission chair, uh, Brandon Hilpert, our outside legal counsel, Chris Cameron, uh, committee member, Diana Dent, and our liaison with the San Diegans for Justice, Kate Yavendetti, and uh, Joe Craver is absent. Uh, he's unable to join us today. And got me, Doug. I'm sorry. Patrick. I didn't scroll down far enough. You were at the bottom of my list. <laughs> so, thank you, Patrick. Wow. Wow, Doug. <laughs> no. Wow. Bottom of your list. <laughs> well, I even moved to the top. So maybe because you spoke, you moved to the top. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, we don't. We did not have an, a, a uh, note taker last week because uh, it was a fairly brief meeting since we didn't get the uh, draft ordinance, which was the es essence of our meeting. But we do have that this week, um, and uh, I'm not sure whose turn it is. Probably mine. Okay, then Nancy volunteers. And did we receive any public comment? No public comment received. Okay. Uh, updates uh, the budget process. The governor, not the governor, <laughs> the mayor, assigned the budget into uh, uh, you know, signed the budget uh, this past week. In terms of staffing, uh, we have hired the uh, executive assistant. And uh, Charmaine, ref refresh my memory of what her name is. What did Charmaine already leave? Charmaine had to step away. Yeah, because Charmaine is doing some onboarding. Um, Brandon, do you recall the name? Uh, I believe it's Elena Conde, C-O-N-D-E, I believe it is. Okay. And uh, they have uh, selected the administrative aide, who is the person who will uh, be the uh, complaints coordinator, as well as uh, handling uh, budget uh, and finance issues. And um, they're completing the uh, process of uh, doing all the administrative stuff that's required to uh, hire that person. Um, and so our next uh, plan is to uh, hire the assistant executive director who will be the uh, community uh, outreach coordinator. Um, and I think that the uh, job description is complete. Is that correct, Patrick, or is it still? Uh, yeah, we. I believe we finished it. Um... Okay. And then the uh, <clears throat> second process is the uh, status of a proposal for a selection process. Um, and uh, Charmaine said she has not gotten a uh, response yet uh, from uh, human resources on uh, whether there's a limit to the number of people that can participate in a community forum. Uh, but why don't you give us a, a very brief uh, reminder of uh, what is being proposed for the, uh, for the selection process. So we had had a discussion about asking um, the finalists to make a public presentation at a community forum so that community members could engage with that person and have a voice in the process. Um, there were concerns raised about how that might limit the applicant pool, particularly for people who have a current job and may not want their employers or supervisors or coworkers to know that they're applying for another job. And so <clears throat> I spent some time thinking about that and proposed that we, um, so we have the selection committee, which is a formal uh, committee with representation from the city, from the commission, and from the public, multiple reps uh, from the community. Um, and then in addition to that, we invite a small number of community organization leaders, so say a group of 10, 
um, to meet with uh, the finalists in a smaller forum, which um, in addition to sort of um, moderating that previous concern, it would probably also be a bit more intimidating or a bit less intimidating and would foster a real, it, it would be more likely to foster a real conversation um, rather than, you know, the finalists making a formal presentation and just doing a Q&A. It, it could foster more back and forth. Um, so my proposal was that we have the selection committee, which would include representatives of, of the public. Um, and then that committee put together a group of 10 for a kind of uh, forum discussion um, with the finalists. And the expectation for that group of 10 would be that after those forums, um, we, would, we would prepare a survey for them with questions that weren't so much about you know, we might ask them to rank the finalists, but really we'd have more qualitative, substantive questions as a part of that survey. Um, so what were the strengths and weaknesses? Um, uh, you know, are there any concerns you had about this candidate's history or qualifications and so on? So that was the proposal that I put forward a couple of weeks ago. Okay, and then going back briefly to the staffing, I forgot to mention that uh, the city council has on its uh, consent agenda for next Tuesday. Uh, I think the 29th is Tuesday. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, creation of the positions, the exempt positions um, that will be exempt from the uh, civil service. And so they have a resolution that describes each of the positions. And again, those positions are in the general council. Um, the uh, supervising investigator, the investigators, the uh, policy analyst and the performance auditor. Um, and uh, so it creates those positions and exempts them from the uh, from the civil service. It's on, on consent. Uh, I don't expect uh, there to be any controversy or for anybody to, to pull it, uh, but you never know. So Charmaine and I will be, oops, will be attending uh, just in case it does get pulled from consent. Um, the next item is uh, office space. Uh, Charmaine got a call this past week uh, from uh, real estate's assets uh, with a- with, with, Say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go, okay, I'll, I'll go back to D then. Um, okay. um, <clears throat> informing us of a potential uh, space that we're going to uh, check out next week. It's in the uh, Symphony um, uh, Symphony Building on, I guess, was that B Street, and it's part of the suite uh, that is currently occupied by the. Uh, San Diego Tourism Authority or whatever, commission, whatever the, their title is. Um, and so anyway, it looks like it has potential. And uh, so we'll be taking a look at that um, and reporting back next week. And we'll go back to uh, uh, D, uh, the implementation ordinance and permanent operating procedures. Um, I think as everybody is aware, uh, the uh, first draft of the ordinance uh, was released on uh, Monday evening and uh, the commission reviewed it and made some initial comments at our meeting on a Tuesday night. Uh, the PSNL had a meeting yesterday and at that meeting, uh, they uh, referred it back to the uh, city attorney to address the uh, community concerns. Uh, the motion that was passed included some specific concerns that uh, the chair uh, Montgomery Stepp had and I forwarded those to everybody on the uh, on the committee. Uh, but in addition, each of the uh, council members uh, mentioned some specific uh, you know, concerns they had. Um, although I'm not sure whether council member Whitburn identified any specific issues or not. Um, but Anyway, so I think in addition to the uh, um, specific issues that were in the motion, it was clear that they're going to be uh, listening to the uh, to the 
community uh, and uh, you know and revising it accordingly. Um, and it's our understanding that the plan is to come back to uh, PSNLN. I'm not sure whether it's going to be a uh, special meeting or just a regular PSNL meeting in September. Uh, the city council is basically off uh, for their summer break during the month of uh, month of August, uh, and so that gives us a little bit more time to uh, to work on evaluating the draft and making recommendations. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, we need to move forward uh, with uh, drafting uh, the uh, standard operating procedures for investigations. And so it, uh, we can add that to our agenda for next week to begin uh, to begin that process. And then I think also, as most people are aware, because we sent it out to the committee, um, San Diegans for Justice uh, drafted uh, their own uh, proposal for the ordinance. Um, and uh, which incorporates uh, many of the suggestions that have come from uh, from the commission uh, that were not included in uh, the uh, city attorney's draft, um, and uh, so that has been uh, put out there. And I'm sure that the review, the community, well, the review by the council members will include uh, all the issues that were included in that draft. Uh, I'm in their draft, and so we'll have to wait and see what the uh, uh, what comes back to us, presumably in September. Uh, standing rules and no changes right now. Um, there is an issue that is arising. We have two more uh, commission members who have announced their intent to. Uh, uh, resign in 30 days, and so we're, the number of uh, commission members is dwindling, uh, and that raises some concerns about quorum and uh, and workload. Yeah, quorum, workload, and also the minimum, you know, re reaching the uh, 10 votes that are required to act on on things. And okay. so, can you say who those members are? uh brandon are we are, are you at liberty to say or not sorry i was on mute i would say until their resignations are official we should keep it confidential okay and um so a couple of yes to so all those things uh i don't know uh whether there's any possibility of getting any appointments done prior to an implementation ordinance. Um, I don't know, maybe Chris can weigh in and and I, you may not be able to do this on top of your head, but uh, I guess the question is, is it possible for the uh, city council to uh, make some interim appointments in, until the uh, implementation ordinance is adopted? Or, or fill the vacancies on, yeah. I think we can we can certainly take a look at that. I think it may be problematic or challenging since we're no longer under the CRB anymore. Um, but there isn't an implement enough of an implementation ordinance for the commission or for the council to feel like they can do that. But we'll take a look um, just to make sure. Um, I think it's probably going to be a question that falls to the city attorney's office, though. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I had a, another part of that question, Chris, sure. and this is probably a little off base, as usual, but um, can the mayor do an executive order for uh, to start appointments immediately? I know I know the mayor is out of Measure B, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if uh, he had the ability to, to do some kind of an executive order. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I wouldn't be able to answer that off the top of my head, but as we think about this, we'll consider that as well. I would be, I would be concerned about that um, from the perspective of precedent. I mean, I, I understand the urgency right now, both from within the commission and even more pressingly from the community at large, but 
I, so my concern just thinking about the future is that if a mayor can executive order people onto the commission, would that hold? And, and I don't think, I don't necessarily think the executive order would order particular people on. It might be an executive order to order the council to appoint some interim people. I, I gotcha. Yeah. But, but I don't even know if there's that authority and that's what we would look at. Okay. And, um, and I would sorry sorry to jump in, but I would almost think that if it was set up in a way where just until the implementation ordinance actually happens, and then the city council could then do their official appointments, then it kind of is essentially a short term thing for a, you know a short term solution. But I mean, we could try to figure out what possibly could work. But I think like all of us, I mean, we're getting close close to the point where we're not going to have quorum to even be able to hold meetings. And I'm wondering if, um, you know, and another way to think about this might be because how, who would you put on, you know, what's the learning curve for that individual? And I wonder whether, and, and I'm not saying there's the authority to do this, but in, as, in thinking about this and the ability of the commission to continue to do the work until a permanent commission is in place, you know, is there the ability to reduce the number of members required until appointment of the permanent members to, uh, to uh, solve your quorum issue? Yeah, and so we're, be an, another way to think about it potentially. Yeah, well, and that's part of uh, why I brought that up under standing rules. <clears throat> well, I think we can we can do both tracks. We can uh, ask the city attorney is it possible to have additional appointments, but we can also change our bylaws uh, so that uh, a <clears throat> quorum is defined as a majority of the positions that are filled, and that the minimum vote required on uh, to take action is a majority of the. Uh, yeah, and I and I think that that's where I want to look because you know we're really not the CRB anymore. We're the police commission now. Yeah, but but, but the police commission, but the commission has its bylaws, and we have our own standing. I mean, and the commission itself determines its bylaws, and so the uh, uh, you know we, we can the commission can change the quorum, and the commission can change our ten vote minimum, um, uh, but that needs to be done. Um, you know, by a bylaws change, and we probably need to do that before we have members uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. resign because that we may get into the issue of uh, the minimum number required. And so, um, well, as chair of the uh, rules committee, I will be calling a rules committee prior to our next uh, commission meeting uh, to address that issue. And okay. in, the in the meantime, we can, uh, well, if uh, Chris can do some research and then we can decide next week uh, whether we want to. Well, when is your and when is your next rules committee, or do you call that, those meetings? No, uh, they're on call, and so we, we haven't decided that yet. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Just thinking about time frame. And uh, but then we maybe at, at next week's meeting we can decide whether we want to send an inquiry to the city attorney of what our options are, uh, or maybe Chris is part of your. Uh, your research, you can call the city attorney and ask them. Yeah, we'll I'll have a conversation with them as we kind of work through some advice for you guys, some options. Okay. Um, and then uh, the next item on the agenda, as um, I think people are aware, at the same time the commission was meeting last week, um, San Diegans for Justice uh, held their roundtable. Um, it was initially scheduled as a uh, joint roundtable between uh, the outreach committee and and San Diegans for Justice, um, but since the uh, draft wasn't uh, released in time, um, San Diegans for Justice scheduled a roundtable on Tuesday, and Patrick uh, attended that. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Patrick to uh, give us a, a summary of uh, of that roundtable. Okay, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I asked Doug in advance of this meeting and he did ask me to go ahead and run through a list of concerns that emerged, um, some of which uh, I wrote up after reading the draft multiple times in that 24 hours, um, and then others that came up in the discussion itself and were raised by um, <clears throat> San Diegans for Justice. And Kate, I hope you'll follow my report with a um, by noting any exclusions or anything I forgot to mention. Um, so the first thing to note is that the community was outraged um, and the primary concern, I just, I wanna be very clear and on the public record about this, 
um, this is a, a point of harmony between the community and the commission. Um, the community was outraged uh, with the time frame and a lack of clarity on process. If it was the plan to present a draft ordinance knowing that it would not be sent any further than the PSNLN committee, it would be held um, for multiple meetings until plenty of community input came in. I think if that had been communicated clearly and, and there was trust in that, um, then maybe some of the outreach or the outrage could have been quelled. Um, but the primary concern is that the first demand of the community and the commission for that matter has been transparency and <clears throat> um, involvement in the process itself of drafting this ordinance. So we received the ordinance moments after a Voice of San Diego's story um, about the uh, outrage was published um, and we had 24 hours to review it. Um, so as I mentioned, the primary concern was about transparency in the process. Um, as a part of that first set, set of guiding principles from the roundtable series a few months ago, um, the second sort of uh, 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 part of that, that first item was accountability. And one of the things I noticed about the draft ordinance is that it doesn't include any specific and formalized mode of accountability for the commission itself beyond the individual commissioner remove, removal for cause uh, clauses. And so I would propose, and granted a part of, you know, much of this could be written in, into the bylaws, the standard operating procedures. I believe the ordinance needs to set in place at least an expectation um, that, the, that the commission would be accountable to the public um, at least once a year in some formal, uh, in, in some formal way. And the, San, the, alternate, the alternate draft of the ordinance released by San Diegans for Justice, the voters ordinance, actually includes those mechanisms, um, requiring the commission to hold two annual roundtables um, and to survey the public on how well the commission is doing. Second uh, major concern, of course, is the uh, selection and appointment of commissioners. It was very clear from, from start to finish in that roundtable series a few months ago that the community wants to be involved. They are begging to volunteer their time in selecting their own representatives um, uh, on this commission. The draft ordinance includes no language about, uh, you know, I think it says the community can nominate, um, but the entire authority, now the authority to appoint is absolutely with the city council. There's no question about that. There's no confusion about that. The question is where do these appointments come from? And uh, the voters ordinance places that um, responsibility on the commission, but requires the commission to include um, uh, community input formally. Uh, that's in the voters ordinance, not the draft ordinance we got from the um, from the city attorney. Um, so that was something I highlighted in advance and it emerged within the roundtable. Third major concern that was identified by San Diegans for Justice is this clause about the commission being subject to all collective bargaining. So just to explain what that means, collective bargaining uh, occurs between the city and the police union and collective bargaining often results in protections for protected employees that go well beyond ca uh, California law in the case of police officers. So current California law um, has certain requirements for investigations of police officers that ordinary people don't you know, we don't have those protections, but state law already grants police officers, you know, the one year deadline on discipline, um, uh, representation during an investigation and other things. Um, so I think it, it caught folks by surprise that there would be a subject to collective bargaining agreements clause, mm -hmm. which is unnecessary. Um, and the concern specifically is that it opens the door to the commission being limited in its findings or its investigating its investigations, um, limited by closed door agreements developed between city officials and the police union. Um, 
there's nothing in law that would require a commission like this to be subject to those things. So why that clause is in the draft ordinance, the community did not know, but it was pretty firm it doesn't want it there. Um, uh, an additional item, so I think the draft ordinance did a really good job of trying to figure out how to understand representational diversity on the commission, whereas the only requirement used to be that at least one person come from each city council district, we had proposed a more sophisticated model that uses police beat maps, um, complaint maps, data from stops and searches, and so on. Um, but the census data maps that the city council is using doesn't quite go all the way at getting better representation from uh, neighborhoods and areas that receive much more, uh, you know, that, that experience much many more police contacts than other areas. So we would recommend going back to the proposal we put forward and actually looking at some of those other data sources for putting together that diversity. There was also a concern that there, there did need to be some more flexibility there. So if the police division and city council district maps are both being used, it needs to be explicit that there might be crossover between those representations. So for example, I'm in district six, I'm also I think in Northwestern division of PD. So I could serve as a representative of both. We don't need additional representatives to cover all those different areas. Um, okay, a couple of uh, uh, other concerns that aren't quite as um, sort of high frequency as, as those, but are the, oh, I'm sorry, I missed, I forgot one, that's the subpoena power. And I did note that the commission um, uh, identified that in the memo. Um, uh, I assume those of you who were at the round table heard us talking about that right at the outset because it was a major issue. And just for the anybody watching this video, um, Measure B makes clear that subpoena power is enjoyed by the commission throughout all of its processes, but the draft ordinance limits subpoena power, uh, the use of subpoena power to investigative proceedings, which are like the hearings um, uh, at the end of the process. Okay, um, page 16 of the draft order, there was a concern with, um, there was a concern with sub point nine, which has to do with uh, the commission being empowered to um, analyze and uh, make recommendations about policy and procedures. Um, the concern was that this point says may, but is not required to, and the community felt like that was not strong language, uh, strong enough language that the commission was going to have a staff member who's a policy analyst, it must do these things. So after the round table, I went back and look at, looked at measure B and realized that measure B actually, this is language directly from measure B. Um, so I think, I think we should carry this concern into the standard operating procedures. Um, rather than expecting it in the draft ordinance. And I think we will, um, uh, because those of us on the commission currently understand that the policy work we do is a key part of what we do. Um, page 18, there was a concern with, um, so if you look at the top of that, it's a carryover of subpoint 12. Um, uh, the, the, uh, this part of the draft ordinance requires the commission to forward all complaints to the police department within five business days. Um, for the benefit of the public, there are two ways to three ways to file complaints currently. You can speak to a sergeant on scene, um, you can call into the police department after, or you can contact the commission. All of those complaints um, ideally will eventually make their way to the commission. The problem is there's no similar language to require the police department to share complaints, all complaints, including those it designates um, as category two, and I think those it categorizes as informal. I think that the commission, need, as uh, those on the commission will understand this, and I can spend more time on it if we need to, but we need to be auditing which complaints are categorized as informal. Also on that page 18 in the education section, um, 
the community wanted to make sure that the training of commissioners include structured, formal, and robust training provided by community groups. Um, I think we can write that into our standard operating procedures or bylaws, but or standing rules, but but it needs to be a part of um, uh, the commission in some way. Um, uh, same thing with academy training. Uh, we want to be able to um, understand how officers are trained and have some input, including community input, on what that training looks like. Um, it's also very important in this draft ordinance um, that the commission have access to all documents. Um, uh, uh, that are used by the police department in making evaluations about um, uh, about its officers. And I, am, I personally think that we actually need to call out what all documents includes. It includes dispatch logs. It includes GPS tracker data. It includes all training bulletins, department orders, and special unit policies. I think those things have to be called out in the draft ordinance because the draft or in the ordinance because the ordinance is the only place of all the documents we have standard op uh, operating procedures bylaws and standing rules the only one that the police department is actually legally bound to is the ordinance itself so there was some concern that documents be called out um, a few other things of concern. There was concern about the definition of investigation and in specifically the way that the draft ordinance limits findings and what can be done with them. Um, there was concern that the um, police chief is not required to respond um, to many of the uh, commission's reports, memos, and recommendations. That needs to be a requirement. Um, uh, uh, going back to a point I made a moment ago, the police department needs to have ideally a 24 hour limit on forwarding all complaints to the commission. There's no reason why the police department would need more than that. In fact, as we all know, the police department has a system, a database um, piece of software for tracking these complaints. Um, and it would be very easy just to give our executive director access uh, as we've been requesting for years. Um, uh, again, the limits on the subpoena power should be removed from the ordinance. Um, all we need is a phrase that says, uh, you know, the commission has subpoena power for all of its activities as allowed by California state law or state, federal and local law. Um, I've already talked about the collective bargaining. Um, uh, I think that's, I think that the, those, are, those are the big things that I kept on my list. Kate, have I missed anything major? Well, that's what I have on my list, but I also had a couple things that I, that I had raised and one you talked about earlier, and that is that the commission is responsible for um, uh, determining the new uh, executive director. And I don't, I don't think that was in the ordinance and I don't think that was on your list. No, that's and, in the commission memo that the- that I, I know, yeah. but- Just I, to make I, it, it clear, yeah. It was just something that was raised at the, at the forum. There's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just wanna say as, a, as kind of, you know, a backtrack that I thought the memo that you guys did was excellent. I was really pleased to see, obviously I couldn't go to that meeting because I was at the other one, and um, but I, I was really pleased to see that. Uh, the other thing that was raised was the, um, uh, on the transparency issue on uh, the website posting of cases. And I know that you're currently working on that, but I think that needs to be explicit that that's gonna be done and um, and I just had a, a minor issue. I don't I don't think I even raised it, but that was the issue of the advisory committees, and I don't know if that's something that would be in the ordinance. I frankly haven't read Andrea's forty five page voters ordinance yet, so I don't know if that's in there. But there has been discussion and agreement that there would be certain advisory committees. And I think I that could be in, in the bylaws of the. Uh... 
It is? No, I say it could be in the bylaws of the commission itself. Okay. Okay. And, um, those, are, those are the only things that I that I wanted to add as, as issues that jumped out at me. And uh, Oh, and the other thing that I wanted to add was uh, that I think I raised at the community meeting was, and I have a note here, page 15, but I don't have it in front of me, was that the commission consider all can consider all prior complaints, not just prior sustained complaints. So that the commission has the ability to, to see if there's a pattern, even if they haven't been sustained. That's right. And, and that reminds me of, not because it's related, but one other thing, the draft ordinance puts more limits on um, requirements for potential commissioners than the community wanted. It has detail about cl criminal records um, and it's better than, than, than what was in place for the CRB. Um, but, you know, the, the, the community wanted there to be very, very few limitations on who could be nominated and who could be appointed. And there was particular concern about excluding people um, uh, who have criminal records of any kind. There, you know, the community fully understands that, that some felonies um, are going to create um, concerns uh, and potential legal issues in terms of accessing confidential police data and complainant data. Um, but beyond those, um, beyond those, those sort of formal exclusions, the community wanted very basic requirements, very basic um, qualifications in place, must live in San Diego, um, and it felt that the draft ordinance went too far in how it uh, uh, empowered the, the commission and city council um, uh, to um, use criminal records. Chris, by the way, if anyone's ever sharing their screen, because uh, there's something happening in the chat, um, you, if you, if you uh, hover your cursor over the line between the shared screen and the pictures of all of us, you'll be able to drag that line over and it'll shrink the shared screen so you can see everybody else. Just FYI. Yeah. And I figured out how to uh, stop her, her sharing. Um, but uh, anyway, well, thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, you have that in writing please i mean i have it in scribbles on note cards and my note taking pad um are you are you requesting that i that i type it up i am because i think it'd be very useful for us um okay and uh, there's a lot of good stuff there and some things a couple of things that i wasn't um had not thought of either and so uh if you could, that would be very helpful. Uh, so we don't have any of the key points going to get lost in our in our I, deliberations. You know, I will say I I've read the voters ordinance several times. Um, I provided some feedback bef before it was publicly released. Um, uh, that 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 came, you know, that that helped shape it a little bit, and. Uh, I have to say, I, I think that voters ordinance is extraordinary. I think, you know, I think it, I don't, I don't think there's any part of it that goes too far, you know, or that, or that stretches measure B beyond what most people imagine. Um, I understand, I understand there are dynamics and politics at play that, are good, that would prevent it being um, actually adopted, but um, I, I've got to say, I think it, I think it's it is demonstrative of of the real investment that community members have that such a that such a um, a text was written within forty eight hours of receiving the draft. I'm glad you mentioned that because our the um, PSNL in, met in uh, early February when we presented our recommendations to them, and it took from early February until uh this past week so what's that uh four months to draft uh, the come up with the first draft and then uh andrea st julian uh came up with her draft um in 
48 hours. Um, well, let me just comment that it, it, you know, that's obviously been in the works for a period of time. It, it has been, but I know there's, there's a lot of things that were added. Uh, I mean, it, in response to the uh, draft. And so yeah, yeah, yes, a lot of it was based on the city attorney's draft and a lot of it was based on uh, uh, feedback um, or ideas that have been under discussion. Um, but still, uh, it was uh, put into that, you know, she couldn't put it into that format and, until she saw what the city had. And so um, anyway, I just wanted to note that uh, she was able to formalize that in a uh, couple of days where it took the city attorney four months to uh, formalize theirs based on the input that was received at the uh, PS Nellon meeting back in February. Um, anyway, so looking back at my agenda, which I took off of the screen, so now I need to find it here. Uh, um, oh, the next item is uh, the uh, <laughs> Legal counsel contract. Um, I don't think you were at our meeting, were you, Chris? I wasn't there la last week uh, okay. or Tuesday. Okay, and so we need to uh, work out some of the logistics with you, but the commission was empowered to extend your contract. Um, but we have some uh, questions. Uh, you know, one of the issues is that, that we can't extend it again. Um, because it was a five-year contract and the five years would be up in September of, uh, of next year, so of 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want to be with, without legal counsel for a period of time. And so um, at some point in time, uh, we may have to begin an RFP to uh, have a new outside counsel, because it doesn't look like uh, we may have a, a general counsel hired by uh, mm -hmm. by that time, particularly since uh, the um, you know, things are slipping in terms of our timeline. Our timeline was to be able to get that person on board in June of next year. Uh, the timeline is now moved by at least two months uh, because of uh, the implementation ordinance. And so, uh, maybe we can have some discussions offline as to how to proceed. And then, uh, you know, then the questions are, uh, um, you know, the extension of the contract since it is uh, the former contract with, with the CRB, um, does that does it require amendment of the contract? And, uh, and, and if, anyway, there's, there's some legal yeah. issues that are there and, sure. uh, and sure. so forth. And so we need to maybe have an offline uh, discussion of how to proceed and uh, we didn't have the answers to all those questions uh, but uh, we gave uh, we, we passed a motion uh, authorizing the extension of the contract and then we need to figure out how uh, yeah how to work it out and I'm happy to you know we maybe you and I and Charmaine can get together um, each year there's <clears throat> excuse me an amendment that implements the new budget amount and so right. I, I would foresee that this year's would just have probably a name change as well, but other minor aspects to just, you know, bring it all up to date. Right, and, and that's what we're hoping. Um, and, uh, and then keeping in mind that, uh, uh, you know, at, at any point we could you know, go out to, con out to uh, uh, contract again or RFP process again, uh, but we uh, wanted to have the flexibility so that we're not uh, left uh, without, <laughs> without coverage at any time, so. Um, so I have a question on the issue of the of the legal contract and sort of the scope of it. Um, is is there any reason why uh, Chris or you know wh whoever is part of the contract can't work jointly with the city attorney on this revised ordinance? That I mean, will they not talk to you? Well, we'd I, be happy. I mean, you know, I I, I stay in pretty close contact <coughs> with Joan, but um, when she was when it was being worked on with the with District Four, that was not a document that was shareable with us on your behalf. So, because uh, I mean, you may have heard that some people were actually calling for independent counsel to. I I, I heard that. <laughs> to the <redraft. laughs> I heard the complaints about who the author was, and I thought, well, it's interesting. It's here I am, but nobody knows you have independent counsel. <laughs> and, uh, Sorry, Chris, when, when you say shareable, 
is there anything in law that would have prevented them sharing it so, or yeah i mean you know i suppose we could have done a public records act request but they probably would have declined it based on the deliberative process privilege and that's the privilege to work on things and do drafts and and only have to release it when you're ready to go um, but the city attorney isn't going to share something that they consider to be attorney client confidential communication and at that point remember the city attorney's client is the city council well it's the city as a whole but as represented by their you know highest uh, lawmaking body law is a wily beast it is okay, a wily I beast <laughs> But I, I think that as, answered your as question you is, figured out, you know, most of the people who write the laws are attorneys, <laughs> and we write the laws to protect ourselves <laughs> as much as to protect the public. And um, but the answer to your question is, I forget how you worded it. Uh, I think your your question was, is there anything that prohibits it? And so I guess the answer would be no. And, no. Uh, yeah, but she was not at liberty to share that with me because. Right. Yeah. But that's a good point, Kate, because uh, Chris, you know does have a working relationship with Joan. And uh, so we can you know, work those channels uh, as we work mm -hmm. on, we work on this. Well, um, you know, and the other thing that I think is that Chris knows more about, like you folks do, more about the inner workings of the CPP and the needs of it. I mean, one of the things that was really obvious to me when, when Von Wilpert was talking about how the subpoena power really wasn't limited because it talked about investigatory proceedings if she didn't understand the difference between investigations and investigatory proceedings. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how much of that, I, I'm not sure how much of the limits were deliberate and how much of it was just based yeah. on not really understanding, um, you know, how things really work. Well, and you can really see that in the definition section of the draft, because there's a lot of confusion between what investigation says and what investigative proceeding says. The concern is that the way it's written, there's the potential to limit subpoena to hearings because of how investigative procedures were defined. Um, and how it was separated out from a definition of investigation. I think, you know, th but, but the fact of the matter is that subpoenas should also be permittable for policy analysis and review of other documents and review of other things outside of a specific complaint. Um, I, I, Kate, I think, you know, I have been stressing this point with every journalist I've spoken to this week at the public roundtable and everywhere else. The, you know, if you set aside all of the politics about this moment, the fact of the matter is that commission members and commission staff right now and a handful of community members are actually the skilled workers. We're the ones who know how to do oversight according to best practices. This is an actual field. Um, and that's why I kept characterizing myself as a factory worker. I know how to work the machines. I know what it means to do X, Y, and Z. And so if you set aside the politics for an ordinance that's about skilled labor to be written by people who have never been trained or experienced in that skilled labor, it's ridiculous. You know, it's like the old Buddhist um, allegory of four blind people uh, explaining what an elephant is by the feel of what, whatever the, t uh, now I'm going way off. Anyway, off so path, yeah, yeah. but you know what I mean? I don't need the metaphor. Yeah, let, let, let me get back to our agenda. Um, so we have no uh, unfinished business. Uh, my plan for today uh, was to ident identify the topic areas that we think that we need to discuss um, as a committee of key areas um, for revision or addition or whatever it happens to be to the ordinance. Uh, we have, I think, four meetings uh, in July prior to the commission meeting, one, two, three, four, because um, the commission meets again on the 27th. And so kind of to divide it into groups, I was hoping to start today, uh, but we're not gonna have time, but my initial plan was to first identify those key areas and then uh, 
start with the first area, which is the composition of the commission and how they are selected. Um, the uh, voters ordinance uh, that uh, San Diego's for Justice came up with a new process, uh, which I think is very interesting. And I want to be able to discuss that as well as some of the issues that Patrick uh, brought up. Um, so I would propose, let me make some proposals of of things to discuss and then you guys can add to it. But I would like to have discuss that first is the uh, uh, composition of the commission and the selection process. Um, I think uh, the investigation process and definitions and the subpoena uh, process, uh, the issue of uh, collective bargaining agreements and how that affects the commission. Uh, so, well, those are some of the ones that come to my mind immediately and, and, and as I'm trying to Think of other things, uh, Patrick. Maybe you can look over your list and uh, add to it. Yeah. So, I, first of all, I would expand number three, collective bargaining, um, to uh, to be a larger category. We could call it interactions with PD. It it should include collective bargaining. I believe that we and the commission should come out strongly against that clause. Um, I I'm, I I was not the person who noticed that. It was I think it was Andrea. Um, or at least San Diegans with, for Justice. And as soon as I started thinking about it, I realized she's right. Um, uh, so, but I would include a larger category interacting with PD that would include collective bargaining. It would include a requirement for the, for, for the chief to respond within a certain time frame to our recommendations. It would include the sharing of complaints and time limits in, on both, in both directions. And it would include access to all complaints, including auditing those complaints that had been categorized as informal. Um, let me make sure that's all that's on that list. And um, I also would. Uh, um, oh, and maybe, it would, maybe sorry, it, it would include academy training, the ability to have access to um, training documents, department orders policy for special units and training materials from the academy. So all of those could go into this category of interactions with PD. Sorry, Doug. That's okay. Yeah. And a lot of those we uh, talked about that last week or two weeks ago with our uh, items for the uh, uh, MOU, uh, but some of them as uh, Patrick uh, correctly pointed out, we want at least referenced in the uh, in the ordinance because um, that's what gives us the legal authority. And unless we have it there, then the POA doesn't have to come to an agreement on the right. uh, on the MOU. And one thing that I thought was kind of weak in the draft ordinance, and I don't recall the specifics, uh, but it was kind of weak in terms of uh, providing records related to investigations. And we want to be able to have, essentially we, we think we should be able to access all records of the department uh, in our review of uh, policies, practices, and procedures. And so we need a much more robust uh, uh, section there. Um, and, then, and then I have one other category um, that I would propose for your big list. Um, I think you've, you've, you've basically hit on everything um, because, um, Councilmember Montgomery Stepp's memo includes asking the city attorney to to write whistleblower protection in. Do I remember that correctly? Yeah, but okay. uh, we but we have not discussed that, and so uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I would support that. But the other thing I I think we should do because it it um, I mean it's a sign of good faith, but it's also good generally practice for us to do this is that very first accountability, transparency and account accountability point. Um, so in the voters ordinance, 
released by San Diegans for Justice, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole section on accountability to the community, um, not just removal for cause by city council or the commission, but also holding the commission accountable to the community. Um, the draft ordinance does, does have some sections on requirements for the commission to release, to collect and release data to the public. But I think, uh, and the community agrees with this, uh, I keep saying the community like it's a monolith. It's really not. Um, local communities agree with this, I should say. Um, uh, but I think we need formalized, I think we should be beholden to these by the ordinance um, uh, so that this and any future commission couldn't just decide not to do it but a formal requirement to hold listening sessions, not education sessions with the public and to collect survey data. So we know how we're doing um, and can make changes accordingly. So that would be the, the fourth, I guess, category on the list. Okay. And we can, we can look at the voters ordinance for a good example of that. Okay, so in, in terms of topics, uh, so we have the commission, the composition selection of the commission, uh, the investigation process and subpoena process, uh, interactions with the police department, uh, including collective bargaining uh, response to, to uh, recommendations and record sharing, and then uh, transparency and accountability issues is one, two, three, four areas. Does that make sense maybe to have those four areas of for us to uh, talk about at our next four meetings and then we can come up with recommendations for the for the full commission. Uh, Nancy uh, and Diana and Brandon is there anything that you guys want to uh, bring up. Um, I mean the only thing I would say is and just kind of adding mostly because it's a public meeting I think we all know this is part of the subpoena power thing is. You know, if I was a betting man, if the implementation ordinance isn't clear that we have the power, the first time we use a subpoena that the POA or the department doesn't want to follow, I guarantee you they'll take it to court to try to fight it. So that's why I think it's very clear uh, that we need to make sure the implementation ordinance gives us that explicit power. But, but I, I think I think we're all on the same page on that one. But I know we'll get to that later. Okay. And, and just to kind of not to kind of jump too ahead too much here, but one thing I've I've not heard talked about in the subpoena power and something you may want to consider is <clears throat> it's unclear to me why you have a two part process with your subpoenas. If the commission already has to make the findings on the issuance of the subpoena, why does the commission have to authorize enforcing the subpoena? Um, you know, what are they going to do back away from it rather than go to court to compel the production of the documents or the appearance of the witness. It seems to me that once the Commission has spoken as to the issuance that it would be in the power of the executive director or the investigator to facilitate that compulsion in the, in the Superior Court. Okay. Uh, think about. So, can I ask a question about that? Well, no, let's hold off on that okay. until, we get to, until we get to that. Because I want to. I'm going to get you guys way down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and uh, so, Nancy and uh, Diana, is there anything else that you want us to talk about in the ordinances? My head is spinning, so I hope Diana can make some input or maybe even Brandon can add to it. I don't know, not me. Like um, Patrick, I've read it several times, the, the implementation ordinance. And so I mean, the things that have been, you know, that's been um, talked about are some of the things or the concerns that I had as well. So those are the four major things that we're going to um, really push forward on. I'm, I'm in, I am in agreement with that. Okay, and it doesn't mean that if we come up with something else that we haven't uh, discussed today or you think about later as you go through a, a deeper dive into the city's draft or looking at the uh, voter the voters draft as it's referred to uh, we can you know we're not limited to these but i wanted to try to lay out a game plan um and so doug i have five are you are you putting together the investigation process and subpoena power as one yes okay thanks 
Okay. And um, and then we need at some point uh, to begin working on the investigation procedures because we want to be able to have those in a form uh, that can. I guess we'll have to coordinate uh, with uh, Monica's office to see how she wants us to do that. But the city attorney's office has asked us, given us the opportunity to draft the investigation uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, and it would be good to uh, have those ready uh, for the city council to look at uh, when they look at the, the uh, implementation ordinance, they can go together as a package for, for me to confer. Um, and I'm wondering whether if we're going to spend our time at our next four meetings working on the ordinance itself, maybe we ought to have a subcommittee uh, that works on the investigation uh, uh, procedures. Does that sound like a good idea? Okay, and then let's see who was willing to volunteer to serve on a subcommittee to uh, work on the investigation procedures. Um, and I'm going to call out some people. <laughs> we, we, we want Chris to be part of that uh, because Chris will help, need to help us with the, the drafting and legal issues there. Um, I think uh, we want uh, an attorney on the committee <laughs> in addition to uh, Chris. And so I think if, if Kate's willing to do it, um, and uh, let me ask this question, maybe of Chris, how much can we accomplish by email and how much without violating the Brown Act? Since this is an ad hoc committee and it's a subcommittee of an ad hoc committee, can we? Uh... I mean, you don't have to have public meetings when you have a subcommittee, as long as it's ad hoc, it's purpose is temporary. It's comprised of not more or not, not a quorum of any of your um, formally created committees and you don't create it by formal action. So, um, so, you know, we don't have to, you don't have to do Brown Act notice for your meeting, for the meetings of the subcommittee. Okay, because I'm hoping that we can maybe accomplish a lot of this without, uh, without meetings. Because uh, I know that, that uh, not everybody here has the ability to attend additional meetings. <laughs> and um, well, I, I didn't, I kind of volunteered, Kate, but Kate, are you willing to uh, well, assist? Well, I, I thought we already, don't we have drafts of investigation procedures from other uh, venues? Well, we do, and we have. I mean, this uh, isn't something that we're starting from scratch, right? And my only, well, I mean, time is an issue for me. But the other thing is, is that this may be more. Um, I mean, it's not something that that I have the experience with as you guys do, right? About what you're going to need in an investigation. But I can certainly take the, you know, the stuff from Oakland and San Francisco and wherever, and we can certainly start with that. Yeah, well, I think what we decided to do was everybody seemed to agree that the uh, uh, CLURB was a good starting point. Um, and because their procedures are very detailed and, uh, and then we can uh, blend other stuff into it. Um, I, I mean, I think if, if you, if you would like us to, if you have a good, if you feel like CLURB is a good starting point or you feel that Oakland is a good starting point, um, I think that we could take whatever you like the most of and then begin to kind of match it up and let you know the areas where we're going to have to make modifications to conform with our own ordinance uh, measure and implementing, for, you know, whichever of these implementing ordinances we end up with. Okay. Um, and, and so if you like CLURB, we could certainly kind of take that as a starting point and then kind of work through it and identify those areas that are going to have to change. Sometimes the change will be easy, like this has to say this because that's what our ordinance says. Sometimes it'll be, well, it can't say this because that's not within our ordinance, but there's options for how we could address accomplishing this task. 
or this component of the, the, the um, investigative procedures. So if you want to give us a little while to kind of pull that together, if you know you like CLURB, we can do it with CLURB. If you don't, and we need to meet first and decide what we like and what we want to start at, use as a starting point, we can do that first. Yeah, I, I would I, encourage I, Oakland too. Yeah, if, no, that's, yeah, and we yeah. can kind of take a combination of the two. Right, of them yeah, I'm envisioning kind of, a, a blending yeah. together. Okay. And we, particularly in terms of the investigative proceedings, we liked CLURB. Um, okay. In, in terms of some of the details of the investigation process itself, I think Oakland uh, and some others were good. Uh, okay. And so maybe we can start there and. So maybe before we dive in, maybe it does make sense to sit down on a first meeting with kind of CLURB and Oakland and maybe go through and say, yes, you know, investigative process from Oakland, investigative proceedings and hearings from CLURB, and then we can kind of go away and push those together and see how that looks and come back and meet again. Okay. And so, um, Patrick. Are you willing to? Uh... I've I've got to stay focused on community engagement. I just I have to and okay. keep up with team as well. I I would recommend that we get somebody who has even if it's another community member, somebody who's actually got professional experience as an investigator too. If I mean maybe Jason would be willing to take a look at it at some stage. He's so Dave, generous with his okay. time. What about Dave Myers? I don't know if he'd be interested. I don't know him. Oh, he's the he was a longtime thirty year uh, um, sheriff, and uh, I think he now works with Mogo. Oh, oh, yeah. He, he was, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. He was the deputy he, that ran for sheriff. Did he testify? Huh? Yeah. Did he testify at the PSNL? Yes, he did. Yes, I heard yeah. him. Okay. And um, well, that's, he's that's already he's an attorney. Uh, maybe a. Um, I don't know, maybe Genevieve would be um, willing to uh, to assist. And maybe, uh, um, I guess what I'm thinking is maybe we can have Genevieve and Jason look at it after we come up with a outline. Um, and yeah, I think I think they're helpful in terms of the the kind of politics and the community side of it. But I think Kate's right that it would be, I think it was Kate who said, it would be really helpful to have somebody who is an investigator. Well, see, and Jason is, and that's Jason. Jason yeah, okay, great. Because I mean, they understand what kinds of things get in their way as investigators that seem logical to you and I, but cause them difficulty in getting out the facts. Okay. Um. I think it might also be helpful to have, um, I just pulled it up now, Sue Quinn, local in our community, who was the one of the first presidents of NACOL, um, gave a testimony to President Obama's task force in 2015. Um, and I just put it in the chat. Uh, we can, we can I, I guess we can't really talk about this, but it's a pretty short document with just bullet points on um, aspects of, of oversight committees that are absolutely essential. And I, if I remember correctly, there, there's a part of this that's about investigations too. Yeah, there is. Okay. I'd rather have anyway, somebody from this committee in addition to me work with Chris to come up with the initial outline. Uh, Nancy. I think Nancy would be great. Nancy knows hey. investigations inside and out. No, she doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yes, you do, Nancy. You're 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 very good at. Yes, think about how you get up. I shouldn't say that. Think about how well versed you are on what a good interview looks like and what a bad interview looks like, and so on. I'm just a snoop. I'm not really an investigator. Well, we're not. I mean, we're asking for somebody to come up with an outline of what the investigation process oh should look like. <laughs> um, um, so is that a yes or a no, Nancy? All right, I'll try. Okay. I just don't know how you want me to prioritize this over the 12 cases that my team, Patrick and I and others are looking at. 
That's all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, we all have the same uh, the yeah. same challenges, and it's going to get uh, even more challenging if we lose members. Members, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so we have a subcommittee. I'll chair the subcommittee, and it'll be me, Chris, okay. and Nancy. And then we will, after we have a and draft. Kate? And Brandon just volunteered in the chat. Oh, Brandon. Okay, good. Thank you, Brandon. Um, then, then um, well, let's be careful. So, um, how many? So, this is a this committee right now is or isn't a Brown Act committee? This is not a Brown Act committee. Not okay. I mean, this one right here that we're in the transition committee. This is an ad hoc committee, so it's not a it's Brown also Act. ad hoc. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. I just know that there are agendas for this meeting, so wanted to confirm. Yeah, and so we 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 don't have to, but we have we publicize the agenda yeah. and we record it to for transparency but we're not required by law to do that okay um, anyway so um and then we're going to uh let kate and uh, jason if he's willing and i think he probably would be and sue uh, was there anybody else who wanted to oh and uh genevieve to uh, take a look at what we come up with and uh so the first thing will be maybe for the uh our subcommittee, uh, which is me, uh, Chris, Brandon, and Nancy, to uh, discuss what we like about uh, Oakland and uh, CLURB. And then we can leave it to Chris and her staff to work on drafting something. And then we can uh, maybe have this full committee take a look at it uh, and also have uh, those additional people I talked about to take a look at it as well. Maybe have the other people take a look at it and then come back to uh, mm -hmm. back to this committee. Um, and, and we can actually have this committee um, work on it in August. Uh, what's important that we get done is the stuff on the ordinance itself because we wanna be able to have the commission uh, bless what our committee our committee comes up with when, when they meet at the open meeting in July. Okay, uh, anything else we need to accomplish today? I have one quick question that this has just reminded me of. Um, didn't we say several months ago that the ordinance needs to stipulate investigator access to IA interviews? I need to look and see whether that that's in the ordinance or the standard operating procedures. I thought we had said it needs to be in the ordinance. I thought that our the advice we got from John and Jason up north was that that needed to be in the ordinance. And I'm just realizing that I didn't. I think I didn't, you're right, and I think I didn't that that was, flag that. And I think that that was one of the th and I, things I'm. Um, it's in. Hold on a second here. Um, that was right. If that's true, yes, it then, is. Yeah, yes. and and so that in our uh, under item two, we should add that interactions yes. with PD. That's uh, crucial. It's absolutely crucial. Or maybe yeah, or even under investigations, one of the two. Uh, but we have we do have in our our previous. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Document uh, from April, which we approved, it says uh, commission shall investigators shall have access alongside SDPD investigators to incident scenes. Uh, and I forget whether or not the uh, voters ordinance included that or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we can discuss that as either part of the uh, investigation process or the interactions process. But uh, yes, that does need to be in the ordinance. I think you're right. It goes under investigations. I was just looking at the wrong number. Yes. But yeah, don't forget that point. That's an important one. Okay. Uh, next week is uh, July the 1st, I think, or July 2nd. Um, it's part of the uh, 4th of July weekend, but the 4th of July is on Sunday and the official uh, holiday is on Monday. Does that create a problem for anybody here at meeting next Friday? No. Okay, uh, then we will proceed uh, next week and uh, the major topic of discussion is gonna be the composition of the commission and the selection process. And with that, uh
Doug, would you like me to send around to the committee and put on the agenda the actual, the original proposal we put forward for that set of questions? I think people have a copy of that. If not, um, that I'll did. send I'll send it around, and you all can decide if it should go go out with the agenda. Okay, because uh, we we included our recommendations to uh, PSNLN, but our recommendations are. Well, I want to take, I guess what I'm saying is I want to relook at that because the process we recommended is different than the process that the San Diegans for Justice came up with or they revised theirs. And I like, I like what San Diegans for Justice uh, came up with, uh, or at least the approach they came up with. And so I kind of want that to be the basis of our discussion. Okay. You know, I just want to add two things. One thing about that composition is that that basically came from the RIPA board. A lot of that so yes. that's that's already in place and the second thing that people don't already know is that the city council is going to be talking about the cpe report next tuesday also the the you know the policing equity report and uh so if people are interested in you know checking in on that we don't know where it is on the agenda we know that the council meeting starts at 11 but if people are interested be advised <laughs> Yeah, some of us watched the video of the uh, community forum, which was at the same time as our commission meeting and the sending for justice meeting. Um, it was advertised as a community forum, but there was no opportunity for community input. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, anyway, I will entertain a motion to adjourn unless there's anything else people want to discuss today. So moved. Okay. And so the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye.